11. I'll just open in prayer. Psalm chapter 11. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this faithful folk, Lord, who come out to listen to your words, Father, at the foot of the cross. Not mine, but yours. We just pray, the Lord, that you will impact our hearts today with what's going on in the world and indeed in our own hearts, Father, in our own lives, in our own families, our own churches, and indeed in this in this uh, country of ours, Lord. We just pray to lay it upon our hearts. Leave the outside world exactly there, the Lord outside, and not to worry about it for this, this next hour, Father. Please just speak to us and guide us, Father, as we seek thy face in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Psalms <coughs> chapter 11. And it says, actually, we'll read this, we read this in unison. We, 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 we call ourselves sort of like an old church. We're going back to the old ways. So how about we read this in unison? Does anyone know what that means? No, <laughs> we read it all together. I haven't done this since I was a kid. <laughs> and if we could read in unison, stand if you wish, or, or stay seated, that's okay. But let's go. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11, chapter 3. Have we got Psalm 11, 3? Yeah. Let's all read this together. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Please be seated. Thank you. If the righteous be destroyed, sorry, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And indeed, we see today that a lot of foundations are being destroyed, and we'll see it in this next uh, sermon about some of the foundations which have been destroyed at this present time. And indeed, I would liken it back to the last hundred years. The foundation has been, or being, was under attack and being destroyed. The foundation that we have in Jesus Christ. So that is our springboard text this morning. But now turn up, please, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I just want to do things a little bit different today. Um, speak on it myself, but also listen to what Danny Castle has to say. So Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. 46 to 49. And it says here, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Many people today profess Christ, but they don't do what he says in Scripture. They disregard it. I've been guilty of that myself. You turn a blind eye to your own sins. But he says, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? It's too hard. We want sin to rule in our lives. That's what we want not to happen. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. Okay, so somebody now who is listening to the Lord and does what the Lord wants. He loves the Lord. I will show you to whom he is like. Verse 48. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat Vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Mm. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that, without a foundation, built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. It's like our recent extensions here or what we've done out the side here we could have just bolted that gazebo directly to the earth but the first wind that would come along would take it right out yeah. we laid the foundations good cement it was drilled properly dyna bolts bolted on and tightened and the wind didn't come and the wind did come and guess what it didn't blow it out <laughs> that afternoon that night it had some strong winds and it stood the test of that day but this is the thing. You need a foundation. And if our foundations be destroyed, what can we do? What can the righteous do? Let's just look at a few words here that we go through this. The word digged deep. 
Your spiritual foundations need to be dug deep in Christ if you are to withstand what this world is going to shoot at you. Especially in these next few years. Currently at the moment. But we've seen in the past, there's always been tribulations, testings in people's lives. Indeed, in the history of countries, there's always been tribulation. There's a bigger one coming, seven years worth. But at this point in time, we're still experiencing these tribulations. But if you are dug deep in Christ and have him as your foundation, guess what? You won't be moved. That's right. You just won't be moved. See, we are not to be dug into religion. We are not to be dug into man's doctrine. We are not to be dug into the tradition of men with place plus, sorry, with faith plus something for salvation. I saw a post this week about an elderly preacher, I think he's since passed, but he was talking about you had to speak in tongues as a sign of salvation. That's faith plus something. That is not faith if you're expecting to have some visible, visible manifestation of googly gook or even speaking in another language. That doesn't prove your salvation. The Bible proves otherwise. It says otherwise. The woman at the, the uh, Samaritan woman at the well, she got saved. She never spoke in tongues. But she was a saved woman. There are many other examples in Scripture. They didn't have Paul's road to Damascus um, salvation. Where it was a bright light, he was blinded, etc., etc. Not everybody has that. You don't need that. That's not a requirement for salvation. The Bible says and shows otherwise. You are not to be dug into your own intellect instead of the Bible. For 1 Timothy 4.2 says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Mankind generally digs himself into a hole that only Christ can get himself out of, get you out of. Yeah. But you think that your intellect is so good that it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to transpond or, or go over the Bible or go further than what the Bible says. Friend, I'm sorry, but our consciences could be seared with a hot iron. Man's intellect cannot be trusted as a foundation. Then we notice the next word is rock. You see, Christ is the rock to build your life on. Everything else will fail. If it's a man, it will fail, as we'll see soon. It will fail. The next word we look at is the word when. Not if. Your life will have trials and tribulations. There will be times and you think, I don't know if I can go on. It's called when, not if. And we've all been through that. And probably some of us are going through it now. Sometimes daily when you're operating a business and you're operating machinery, it's, it's when, it's happening now. There's always something breaking down. Yes, amen. 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 amen, it is. So we deal with it because we've got a good, strong foundation. I see it sometimes and I'm starting to get frustrated with work. I'm thinking, I'm doing this for myself. I said, well, I'm actually working for Christ now. And all of a sudden, it's not hard at all. It's not. If you're doing it for Christ, whatever you do, you want to the Lord. It just fixes it straight away. No more ill feeling inside of, oh, I wish I wasn't here doing this. But, uh, poof, no, I'm doing it for the Lord. That's what makes a difference. If he's your foundation. Then we see the next two words, flood and stream. So he's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat beneathly. The word flood, it can mean to cover or submerge. Okay, so you are flooded, you are submerged with all these things happening to you. With flood or, you know, or water in a flood. So, and it says to arrive in overwhelming amounts or qualities. When we have problems, we are flooded. And it's overwhelming. That's what a flood means. It's overwhelming on us. And it can push us to the brink of breaking up. Then we see the word stream. These words are important, the word flood and stream. The word stream means run or flow in a continuous current in a specified direction. 
So here we are, we're overflowed with all the troubles of life, and now it's this stream of life just going bang, 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 trying to knock you over. Trying to knock you over. Just like a building when it's hit with, with water. We call that hydrology, don't we? I think we do. There's such power in hydrology, in water. Great lots of power, heaps of energy. But it's a stream, and this just keeps attacking us and attacking us. And the next words we look at, it beats vehemently. The word beats means to strike repeatedly and violently so as to hurt or injure someone. Mm. Typically with an implement such as a club or whip. That's what it means to beat something. Or an unjust law or rule. Don't we see we, our foundation to being tempted at this time with these unjust rules and laws? It's beating against us, trying to move us. Well, I don't know about you, but my faith and my foundation is on Christ, and I'm not going to be moved. Mm. I can't move. I have no fear. It beats vehemently. The word vehemently, to act in a forceful, passionate, or intense manner with great feeling. That's vehement. So it's forcing. Life is forcing this way on you. All these trials and tribulations, what we're going through now, it's a flood, it's a stream, and it's beating you vehemently. Beating you vehemently. The word shake is the next word we look at. All these words are so important. And could not shake it. The word shake it mean, means to move an object up or down or from side to side with rapid, forceful, jerky movements. If you are found upon the rock, it can't even shake you. You cannot be moved. You, it will not shake you. You will just be steady, rock solid, and still, full of peace, knowing that God is in control. Here's your foundation. Here's your foundation. Such wonderful words. It couldn't shake it. In other words, no movement whatsoever. None. I feel like that way when I hear bad doctrine coming out, like faith plus works where you can lose your salvation. I'm sorry, you can't. I've been through this numerous times and I've never found any scripture that talks about losing your salvation. It talks about sanctification, but it's not salvation. Totally rock solid. They don't move me. I'm not shaken by it. If you want to go and have fear and live in fear that you think that you've got to work your salvation, you're going to lose it. That's fine. Knock yourself out. But for me, you know, I'm on this rock solid foundation. We cannot be moved. You know, your life will be tested, and it depends on what rock or trust in something other than Christ that you have placed on your life, on which will determine whether you fall apart or stand. Whether you'll break apart at the seams and scream and run out the door with your hands in the air and, and you know, life's got the better of me, or you're going to be rock solid and stand firm in Christ. For the ruin of that house was great. That's what we see next. The ruin of that house was great. In verse 49. And why? Because of disobedience, false trust, shallowness of your foundation. Maybe you've got a foundation, but it's only about you know, 50 mil thick. And that's not going to hold that gazebo out there, which is about that, and it's drilled in depth of your foundation. We need to dig deep. Prolonged trials and insecurity through spiritual CDFs and delusions. A CDF, you're wondering what that is. It's a cunningly devised fable that will shake many a person's faith. A cunningly devised fable. Do a little Google search in your King James Bible Dictionary and have a look how many times it comes up. I think half a dozen times. But each verse is very pointed and straight to the point. Well, 2 Peter 1.16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. See, these people were eyewitnesses. Peter was an eyewitness. And he said, don't fall over, don't fall for those cunningly devised fables. Because that's what they are, they're fables. 
They'll take your, your mind and your heart away from Christ, face it on the world or whatever fear you've got on inside you because your foundations aren't strong enough. Your know, foundations need to be dug deep. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, then I'll be done and we'll play the sermon. Yes, all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. We'll see this in a church setting, which will be mentioned here on the sermon. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10. We'll read down to 23. We have the time. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. This is to the church of Corinth. They had a lot of troubles. Speaking in tongues, believe it or not, was one of them. They were actually cursing God. I think that's in chapter 12. Chapter 12. They were actually cursing God when they were speaking in tongues. It's not a new thing. I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So here we go. They know that it's Jesus Christ is their foundation at this church. They have him. Okay, they have the right foundation. Now if any man build upon this foundation of Jesus Christ, if you build gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest or made known on that day, the day of Christ. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you see here that their foundation is Christ. The church of Corinth was still his church. They had problems and issues, but he still called them my church. They still belonged to the Lord at that stage. They still had the authority. God was sorting them out through Peter. Was it Paul? Sorry about that. Paul. I just looked at Peter before. So this is what was going on in this church. Their foundation was sure, it was rock solid. It depends how you build upon that. Wood, hay, stubble, it's going to burn. But if it's gold and precious uh, stones, etc., it will last. You will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. But guess what? You will still have your salvation. You're still saved. You do not lose it. You will suffer loss, but you'll be saved, so as by fire. Praise God for that. It's not up to my works, because I'll fail for sure. Man will always fail. Verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. See, here he's talking to a group of people, the church at Corinth. People, a collective, not just individuals. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, individually, each and every one of you. He dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, or take it physically. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now that's like losing their candlestick. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are, collectively, as his church, as his church here in Wangaratta. I'll just finish it here. Let no man deceive himself if any... Man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. I like I see that saw that this week with the government. Not only have they messed up with some vaccine um, injections, doubling the dosage, they've also got all these allegations of um, sexual misconduct and rape in government. It's looking very embarrassing for them now. Not only are they losing their integrity, I think it's long gone. It disgusts me that people like this, who are running the country, are still in power. But God is taking them in their own craftiness. Just keep watching as events unfold. Just keep watching what happens in this world with this vaccine and everything else. Just watch what God does. Be on your knees. Pray hard. 
respond to it all. That's what we need to do. And cry out. That is part of our mandate, to cry out. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. So we don't glory in other men. We don't glory in politicians. We don't glory in pastors or preachers or whatever, or televangelists. We don't place our faith in them. We place it in Christ alone. For the Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and your Christ's and Christ's is God. So we see here of the seriousness of the Lord's church at Corinth. As this was a letter to her, to which? To the church here at Corinth. You know, you might be saved, but you haven't built a very good house upon Christ. You know, as individuals we need to. As a church, we need to keep, make sure we don't compromise and let the world to come in and try and change us. No, we've got our foundation. We've got our foundation. Our foundation is Christ. So it's here now. We'll go to the, go to the uh, sermon. Uh, Danny Castle. So we'll just hit stop. Familiar passage of scripture among preachers and Bible students. Every great preacher in history has preached on this text many, many times um, and I'm going to do it this morning by the help of the Lord. I feel like, and I have done this before but uh, many years ago, but I feel like now's the time for this more than ever since I've been preaching. I was seeing this Carrie and them was over there singing them. Um, all they've known all their life is me standing up here screaming and hollering the word of God on Sunday morning. That's all. All three of my girls sitting over there uh, this morning, uh, they've known that all their life. And many of you have been raised in church all your life. All your life. And you don't need something different than what God has for you. I mean, there ain't nothing no better. There ain't nothing no better than Jesus. So we're, this morning, the world's gone crazy. We're going to talk about it this morning. Psalm 11, verse 3. Psalm 11, verse 3. And verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's the verse, also the title of the sermon. The Bible said here two things. If the foundations are destroyed, that's one thing. And the question is, if that happens, what can the righteous do? Now, if you've ever done any kind of building at all, the foundation of a building is what's underneath it, most of the time out of sight, that's holding it up. This building here today has a concrete um, um, foundation. That's what's holding it. There's steel beams inside of them little square things on the side of the wall, about that big with steel, and they go across here, and all the way to this building is on concrete. And down the walls, there's no telling how deep it is. It might be three, three or four feet deep underneath them, them columns, I'm assuming. It usually is. And that's the foundation of this building. That's what holds it up. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about that this morning. And think you, you could take a hurricane or some heavy equipment and actually knock this building down. You could knock this building down and listen you could come back and build another building on this same foundation. I've done it. We've done it before. Uh, if the foundation's solid and good, you can raise it, that's R-A-Z-E, level it with the ground, and build another building right on top of the foundation. But if the foundation's destroyed, you got major problems. What holds it up? Our country is like that tonight, this morning, and I want to preach about that just a little bit. Uh, we, we, our country this morning has three basic foundation that hold us up. We have, we've never heard of a time ever in history where people are talking more about our America and our country, what we are, who we are, where we're going as a country, as a nation, as churches. And so I want to talk about that this morning. Say the devil is doing everything in his power, not just to destroy our country, but destroy the foundations of this country that holds it up. 
there are basically three, and there's a bunch of other stuff underneath them. There's the home, there's the church, and there's the government. Uh, now, school and everything's underneath uh, uh, the government and school, also church too. And those three things are literally what holds up our nation. Our, the, the foundation is usually made of rock. The Bible talks about a rock, the man that built his house upon the rock. So concrete is like rock. It's something solid. You can't, you can't just go out here and build a house on, on just dirt. Uh, it'll, it'll shift, it'll, it'll break the floor, it'll, one side will get higher than the other, it'll sinks and moves and shifts around, and it could even fall. But if you go down on solid rock, you've got a foundation that, that your house is built on. Let's talk first of all this morning about the home. Listen, people, the home is the foundation of society. And marriage is the foundation of the home. It's the concrete. It's what holds up our whole country. Now, the Bible defines marriage as does common sense, as does history, uh, as does uh, literal, normal, biblical definition of marriage is one man married to one woman. Any other definition of marriage is not a historical or a biblical definition of marriage. You can do what you want to. You can believe what you want to. You can do what you want to. But you cannot call a marriage anything but a man and a woman. That's a biblical and historical definition. And the devil's got his guns turned on marriages to try to do it because that's the foundation. That's what holds society up is, is our home. The devil has uh, the, the divorce rate is absolutely going out the roof. Now, I don't believe these reports you hear. You hear a lot of reports coming out nowadays say, did you know divorce is actually down? Well, uh, that's, that's one of them statistics that's trying to make you believe something ain't right. The reason divorce rate is down is because marriage is is down. People just shack it up, don't even bother to get married. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the amount of marriages that are failing is still over 65% uh, in this country. That is a tragedy. When the home goes, society goes. And the devil has everything he's got turned on the home. Everything on TV, movies, Hollywood, uh, that, L, that Lifetime movie network, which is uh, porn for Christian women, uh, uh, that you, some of y'all sit there and feed your old flesh on all day long just because it ain't as bad as some of that stuff you think it's all right. It is, dis, it is designed to destroy your marriage. Uh, you, you never, you, you never, I, I don't watch Hollywood movies, I ain't, ain't all the time, but I have in my life. And when's the last time you saw a movie that come out of Hollywood that had a man and a woman married each other and happily and all that, and it blessed it. You don't see it. You don't see it. Every type of relationship on there is people that are not married, not even in the movie, let alone in real life. And so the devil is trying to make a mockery of God's first institution, and that would be marriage. As a result, we have a bunch of what we call throwaway kids. There's kids all over this country this morning that have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to live. They're swapped around from one place to another. Dogs and cats and animals are being taken care of better in a lot of places than a lot of kids in this country. The situation they have to live in. They're locked up in cages like animals left for days, not able to have food or, or a shower, left in ice cold, freezing weather and beat and tortured. I heard about they had a party not too long ago. They had a 22-month-old baby, 22 months old, not even two years old. It was stabbed. It was molested and its fingers cut off with knives where they'd been partying and mom and dad had got so strung out on drugs. They, they, they are uh, they're doing everything in their power to destroy the basic foundation of the home. This movement, uh, this movement that, that the, the uh, governors and the president and all of them are signing now to allow boys who don't want to be boys to compete in girls' sports is an att attempt of the devil to destroy the home. I, I'd be, honest to goodness, I'd be ashamed uh, to come home. I, I'd be ashamed to come home and say, look here, I, look, I, I won first place. I won the I won the place. Oh, really? Uh, what race was it? Well, really, I was the only boy in it. Uh, but I was raising a bunch of girls. I, wouldn't you be embarrassed to brag about a trophy? You had to meet with a bunch of girls. Lord, have mercy. 
I'm telling you what, people. Uh, listen, brother, if any, uh, you, you didn't win nothing. Uh, you didn't win nothing. If you, if you ain't a girl, you don't win girl sports. It don't matter what you take. You, you, can have your, you can have your ears and jaw took off. You're still a boy. I'm telling you this morning, the devil has an attack on our homes. I'm, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's still. Some of you ain't going to like this. It don't fly, as the world says, but God's plan is still for the man uh, to be the main provider of the house, pay the bills, make the living. The woman be the help me. She can work also in certain cases and do things. The kids be in subjection to the parents, and the, little, the girls grow up respecting daddy, and then one day daddy gives her away in marriage. Listen, that's old-fashioned as cornbread, but cornbread's still good, and that is too. Yes, sir. I'm telling you, he's got his guns turned on on our homes. But then the devil's got number two. He's trying to destroy the foundation of the church. He's trying to destroy the foundation of the church. Let me quote you the architect of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, people. The church is the most important organism on this planet. I know, I know, I just got through talking about the home. You got to have a good home, make good church. I understand all that. But Jesus didn't die for the home, did he? He died for the church. He ain't coming back after the home, he's coming back after the church, his bride. The church is the most important thing on this planet as an organism. It's alive. It's an organism. Now, some of you people, uh, you people listening far and near, wherever you at, this is God's plan. Listen, local church is God's plan. The local church is God's plan. God, Jesus, the Lord has local churches in the Bible. You are to be a part of a local church. You are to be a part of a Bible-believing, local, visible church something that you can see, something that you can be a part of, something that you can fellowship with, something that you can go to. God never promised to ordain or bless the ministry of a lodge. God never promised to ordain or ministry of a group or a club. God never promised to bless an or the Gideons, I mean, fellowship of Christian athletes. All those do good in some places, all of that. But you, you listen, nothing has been promised. The power in the presence of God like a local Bible-believing, autonomous, self-governing, Bible-preaching church that we have here today. The church, and let me tell you what he said. He said, upon this rock, that, that foundation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The devil's doing everything he can to attack the church. He's attacking it from every angle. There's so much religious junk. Carrie sent me a phone, something on my phone this morning. If that's true, that's the most craziest thing I ever heard in my life. The craziest uh, thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, listen, uh, uh, they uh, had a Baptist preacher on there. Some woman that said she's a Baptist preacher, and that she was uh, talking about uh, uh, how wonderful uh, the new. Uh, presidential administration is but they're pushing now and making abortion and more we're even paying for abortions in other countries now with our tax dollars you hear that uh, yeah, oh lord yeah and she, the, the Baptist preacher was saying that uh, abortion is a sacred right or something like that one was a sacred right I think lord have mercy I'm telling you the devil's got everything he can a uh, man said one time he said uh, uh, he said well uh, I said, where do you go to church at? He said, I don't, I don't really go to church. All these organized religions and denominations, they sort of turn me off, and I don't like all that structure, and I, I don't, you know, I don't believe in all that. I, I'm just, me, me and the Lord, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just go to the invisible church. You ever met anybody like that? I go to the invisible church. And uh, uh, he, that they're saying what, I'm, what they're saying is the church out all over the whole world. Now, there are people in jail, in other countries, in places that cannot meet together with a body and they are saved and they are part of the body of Christ. But a church is a local, visible, physical place where you meet. I hear this every week. I hear this every week. Brother Danny, we watch you every service online, but it's just not like being there. 
There's something about, there's something about church when we get together, iron sharpeneth iron, brother. I'm telling you, we get together like a while ago. You can't get that, uh, you can't get that listening to the CD. You're just something about, brethren, we have met to worship uh, and adore the Lord our God. I like that one preacher, he said, uh, that guy said, well, I just go to the invisible church. All, all the churches got something wrong with them. All the churches are this and wrong. That. And you can find fault with any church. You can find plenty wrong with this church. I guarantee it. You can find plenty wrong with me. But don't forget, I can find plenty wrong with you too. Listen, we're not here because we're perfect. We're not here because we're perfect. We're here because we have a perfect God and a perfect Bible and a perfect hope and a perfect heaven to go to and a perfect Savior and a perfect salvation. Listen, people. That guy told me, he said, preacher, he said, uh, I just go to the invisible church. And that guy told him, he said, well, I tell you what, uh, you, when, you, when you get down and out, go, call your invisible pastor to pray for you. And when you need growth, call your invisible deacons to come and bring you some groceries and, then, and when you die, I call you invisible uh, preacher to preach your funeral and get you an invisible grave and be buried, buried in an invisible coffin. Let that, there ain't no such thing as an invisible church. Amen. People out there in the middle of nowhere are part of the body of Christ, but a church is a local, autonomous, Amen. that means self-government. Right. That means nobody outside here controls what goes on here. A local body. I know churches say, well, we can't do this because the denomination won't let us. That ain't an independent church. Uh, independent means you make your own decisions. Independent means you worship God as you follow the Lord and in your own heart. That's right, brother. That's right. And I, I have just a little short, sort of a little admonition for all you folks at home. I'm glad you're watching. Thank God you're watching. Many of you can't get out, but I do want to warn you, don't get in a habit of not coming to church when you're able and when you can because they say whatever you do 30 days becomes a part of you. Ain't that right? You exercise, you diet, you do anything you do 30 days and it will soon be a year since people quit coming to church. And I'm, I understand people are high risk. I get all that. I'm not being judgmental or critical of nobody, but I'm just saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. You've got to get in church. You've got to have church. You've got to have church. The devil, Marilyn Manson, will stand and rip the pages out of a Bible at a concert, just rip them while the people get demon possessed and go crazy and scream. And then he takes the Bible and slings it out there. Y'all see my, my video on that. And he slings it out in the crowd and they just tear into it like a bunch of dogs going after a piece of meat. They hate it. They hate the church. They hate the Bible. Wonder why they don't do the Koran like that. It's funny when somebody does something like that, that's free speech. He's protected, that's art. Okay, let's make one of tearing up the Koran and, 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 uh, and have a statue of Muhammad in urine like they do Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm just making an illustration. You wanna, they hate Jesus. You say, who put Jesus, statue of Jesus in human urine? National Endowment of the Arts, paid for by mine and your tax dollars. Mm. Now, look. If, you, if, you're, if you're upset now, it's going to get worse here in the next couple of minutes. Tighten your seatbelts. The captain has turned on the fastener seatbelt sign, and we may experience turbulence here in the next three or four minutes. But I'm telling you people, listen, I, you don't think the church is under attack? You say, well, Brother Danny, I don't listen to that old hard rock, heavy metal, Marilyn Manson stuff. Well, how about Tim McGraw? Look, I'll tell you when to bow your head. I see all you people at watching home. You think I can't see you? I see you people in New York and in Florida and in England and in Finland and in Africa and those. Well, I see y'all in my spiritual eye. Tim McGraw, quote, quote his song Neon Church. I'm gonna quote you the words of Tim McGraw's song Neon Church. I need Jesus or I need whiskey. Whatever works best to get me through getting over you. Trying to get over some girl. He said, I need Jesus or whiskey, whichever one will help me get over you. You know how many times you heard me say that? When you're trying to get over somebody, you turn to God, drugs and alcohol, or another person. 
Like they say, a girl help you get over another girl. Well, you, you ain't really doing nothing. Well, yeah, uh, uh, or, or drugs or whiskey, right? Listen to this. A little Friday night, hallelujah. A congregation of backsliders just like me. Ain't that right, Frank? Amen. Say amen, Frank. Amen. Say amen. Preach it. Preach it. That I, uh, I'm telling you what I need is a neon church with a jukebox choir full of honky tonk angels with their wings on fire. You know them honky tonk angels that dance in jukebox places on Saturday night? Straight pouring out that Johnny Walker healing. I got a feeling I need a neon church. Baptize me in the bar room smoke. Bartender, preach to me till my heart ain't broke. Ain't that what this place is for? I try to bend his knee, hands up in prayer. That doesn't hurt, just don't keep hanging around what I need right now. Get to sipping that unholy water. Save that hurt like blank for tomorrow. I'll stay here all night. I need a neon church with a jukebox choir full of honky-tonk angels with their wings on fire. Straight pouring out that Johnny Walker healing. I got a feeling I need a neon church. You know, he don't need a neon church. He needs somebody, mama, to turn him over and bust his bottom when he's growing up. And he wouldn't write such blasphemy about God's church. I'm going to tell you, I don't care how good looking he is. I don't care how good he can carry a tune. That's blasphemy against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for the church, and the church is under attack. He said, oh, Brother Danny, uh, you, you can't save the whole day. I know that. I know that. I like the old woman they said back in the war years ago, the north and the south, and the, an old woman, one of them, a soldier come in her yard, and she got a broom, started swinging at him like that right there. And they said, you crazy old woman, you can't win a war like that. She said, no, but I'm going to let people know whose side I'm on. And that's the way I am this morning. My little mouth ain't much. My little ministry ain't my life. But I tell you what, I want people to know whose side I'm on. When the Lord comes back, I want to say, I was on his side. I'm on his side, buddy. You can do what you want to. It's a shoe going to be on the other foot, buddy. I'm telling you, we're gonna, the church is not a choice. Do you hear me? Church is not a choice. Choice is not a P.S. at the end of God's sentence. Church is not a spiritual dot on a little I that God wrote in. It is the main organism on earth. It is the number one concern of God. When, I, when um, uh, Isaac went out there in Genesis 24... And he's looking out there. He was looking for Rebecca. He was looking for Rebecca. You know what Jesus is looking for this morning? His church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. It is the foundation of our country. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you need to, uh, a missionary society is good, but it ought to be done. And let me just teach you this. Most of you know this anyway. Everything that's done ought to be done under the auspices and under the authority of a local Bible-believing church. I had missionaries come to me say, uh, can I come tell about my work? I said, well, where, where you go to church at? What member of a church are you in? Oh, no, I just get help from all churches. I'm not interested in helping a missionary that's not a part of a church. If you want to give something to poor family down the road, that's why we give our offering in here, and the poor family down the road ain't got no groceries. We take them money or buy them groceries and do it through the church. You have missionaries through the church. You help uh, uh, do the work of God through the church. Everything that God does on this earth that lasts is through a church. Amen. Amen. It's a foundation. Where would we be without churches in this country? Amen. Lord have mercy. Amen. But then I'll say quickly, you know, over in Asheville, over in Asheville, Frisco, North Carolina, they spit. Preachers went over from church and preached, and they spit on them, and throw beer on them. You think that was on the news? Think anybody got charged with a hate crime? No, because the world don't care. You say, well, they shouldn't have been out there. They got just as much right to be out there as anybody else, saying what they believe just like anybody else does. Then the third this morning, I'll be done. The third thing that holds our country up is the government. Now, the government is originally ordained by God as ministers to, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable and godly life. The government was made and put in place so that we could live a peaceable life, make a living, buy a house, buy land, all of that kind of stuff. 
but that is swiftly being destroyed right out from under us. Ladies and gentlemen, when our leaders endorse sin and perversion and make it illegal to say anything against it, our, our president, our new president, I pray for him every morning. I pray for him every single morning that God will help him and make the right decision. But our president has stated, I got the quote for you if you want to read it or hear it, you can easily see it, that if an eight-year-old child decides, if a boy, they decide they want to be a girl or decide they want to be a boy and they're not, that nobody should discriminate, nobody should say a word to them, nobody, let them do what they want to do. That's our president. There was a time when I was growing up, the only person to say something like that was in some old seedy, wicked, underground hell hole in the middle of New York City or somewhere. When our leaders endorse sin, Buddy, our foundation's going out from under us. Let me tell you what our foundation is. George Washington, quote, religion and morality are indispensable supports of the United States. George Washington, they don't even like him no more. George Washington said that religion and morality are indispensable. You can't do it without them supports of the United States of America. Abraham Lincoln said the Bible is the best gift God's ever given to man. George Washington said it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. John Adams, listen to this people. You think things ain't changed? Listen to this. John Adams said, quote, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Let me interpret that for you. He said there's no such thing as a government that can take care of people that are full of the devil and controlled by demons and living in perversion and sin. There's no way to control it. Finish the quote. Our constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Adams said the constitution was made for a moral and religious people, not just Christians, just moral in general, morality, which our country was founded on. And he said it is wholly inadequate to govern a group of people that are not that. And let me tell you something. There's a strong move on right now to undermine, get rid of, change, add to, and flip that constitution for what it originally meant. Right. Foundation going out from under us. School, you should learn more at school than how to cut up a frog and question what gender you are. You, you, years ago, they taught kids morals. They taught kids right from wrong. Now, there is no right. There is no wrong. Whatever you think. There, there, the, the, the second amendment that we are to allow to, to own firearms, to go hunting with, to protect our family if need be, is being ripped right out from under us. We have no idea how much our government has changed in the last few and is going to. You seen guys already going up? You ain't seen nothing yet. Shut down the, the drilling down in, in Louisiana of no more new drilling and they shut down the pipeline uh, that we make our own gas and there's 18,000 jobs, uh, counting workers, 10,000 jobs and 8,000 more out of work just like that overnight. You say, well, they're trying to keep the environment clean. We'll turn right around and buy the gas from another country and let them get rich off of it. Right. America ain't polluting the whole world. So look at, get you a globe and look at America. Here's the world and there's America. That little bit of smoke coming out right there going to pollute the whole world's environment? No, they have an agenda. They have an agenda and they're in, they're in cahoots with rich people in China and people that hate our government and they're getting rich off of it. 
They are weakening and working day and night to pass laws to restrict religious freedom and to shut us up, brother. It is not the government's job to tell us what we can do, where we can go, what we can, how we can act, what we can say, what we can, or if you can have a gun. And I'm, while I'm on this, I might as well say this too. I, I watch, I'm, 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 I haven't watched much basketball this year because those people are such haters. But I watched a little bit one the other day and there was the players, no fans, except some of them fake ones. One of them fake ones got hit in the head with a baseball gang. They took him to the hospital and he died of the coronavirus. But they, they said, them, them fake fans are there and they got a ball player sitting here with a mask on, ball player sitting here with a mask on, ball player sitting here with a mask on, coach with a mask on. They can't even sit close to each other. And 10 men out here sweating all over each other, piled up in the floor, they're like that, jawing each other that close with no mask. Now you tell me, where's the social distancing? Counting referee, that's 12, he's breaking law. See what hypocrisy we're dealing with. And I'm not against being safe, I'm not. You should be, I'm not against that at all. You know me, I think you ought to do everything you can to keep yourself safe, I know people are getting sick, but it's funny that in, they won't let churches operate and you get on an airplane, the ceiling ain't that high and it's packed jam full. I flew to Texas not long ago. I could touch six people with my hand just like that. No social distancing. Well, they got that uh, circular sort system of that air in those airplanes or whatever. You breathe it before it gets up there too. Yes, sir. I'm telling you, the government is gone crazy. Amen. You know, you know who I told you last last week or two. They're trying to stop private ownership of property, and they definitely want farms out of business. They don't want you don't be eating meat, which I don't care if every one of them become a vegetarian. I don't care. They'll leave it all for us, right? I'm a meatitarian. Amen. I don't believe in eating vegetables. Uh, not really, I do. But uh, uh, you know what? They say, no, give you an example. Do you know who owns more farmland in the United States than any other person? Bill Gates. Just bought up 242,000 acres. Why? What does Bill Gates want with farmland? Sixty-nine thousand acres in Louisiana, forty-seven thousand in Arkansas, and a hundred. He's worth one hundred twenty-one billion dollars and buying up all the farmland. Farm. Bill Gates is going to be a farmer. Going to get him a tow, plow, and shovel. Got him a hoe. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Crazy people over here made me say it. I heard the president the other day said they're trying to make all the the uh, uh, <laughs> the, the mail trucks electric. All the mail trucks are going to have to be electric. And, then, and you know what they ought to say? I said, when we will all drive electric cars when y'all start flying the electric airplanes. One of them jets that uh, uh, that John Kerry or Al Gore and them flying put out more pollution than all of our cars put together in a year in one trip cross country. Something's going on, y'all. Our government's being destroyed right out from under us. Now the question is this morning, I close with this. What can the righteous do? What can the righteous do? I know a lot of people say, well, I'll just give up, preacher. World going to hell, ain't nothing we can do about it. Just eat, drink, and be merry, and just hope for the best. No, no. What can the righteous do? We can do three things. Number one, you can get your heart right. If I've ever seen a time when you need to get right, it's now. If you ain't right, you better get right. Amen. Amen. 
Uh, like, that, like the old King James boy said, uh, uh, you better get your business right, buddy. <laughs> you better get your business right, people. Uh, the Lord's coming. You better get straight. You better quit sneaking around being a, quit sneaking around being a hypocrite. You better quit li- not live that double life. You better not have that, that sin on the side over here or in the refrigerator or out in the car or in the, under, the, under the seat somewhere. You better get rid of it. You better get your heart right. You, you, can't, you can't get the mote out of our eye when we got a beam in our own. We need to get right. We need the power of God, brother. Christians need to rise up and say that the foundations are being destroyed, but I'm gonna do right. Number two, we ought to be salt and light. We ought to be salt and light. We are the salt of the world. We are the light of the world. People are struggling. Be a light. That's why we're putting out these little CDs and videos. Show them the Bible. No, we give out tracts yesterday, those plagues, plagues, plagues. You know what? Trying to sow a little light. Men... uh, Chris back there, and we just and give out some tracks and that look. Be a little light. Be a light. Be a light. Be a light. There's people that you work with don't know what's going on. There's people that you work with don't know about the mark of the beast. They don't know about the rapture. They don't know what's going to happen. Be a light. Be salt, brother. Spread out some tracks. Put out the seed, brother. At school and traffic, get in the buses. Man, we had a mob out here. Kids going visiting yesterday. We just needed some adults. We need some. Adults. Lord, in mercy, put out the light, y'all. Be some salt. Scatter it out there. Uh, be salt and light. Then the third thing in closing, be in the rescue work. Get in the rescue work. I have never seen so many people praying the Lord would come back as I have now. I've always heard a few people that try to be real spiritual and say, even so, come quickly. They're living it up down here. But people now are sincerely saying, Lord, come get us out of here. You know, I've always said, when it gets to that, that's when he'll come. That's what he did in Egypt. When Egypt got bad, y'all, Carrie, y'all come back up here and do that a verse of that song again for us in a minute. We'll go. When Egypt got bad, the Bible said the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard them and sent a deliverer. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you salt? Are you light? Are you being a witness for Jesus? Listen, this ain't no recreation room. This ain't no game, buddy. It's war. This is war. Yeah, I mean, it's fight to the finish, man. This morning, maybe you'd like to just come down here and get down on your knees and say, Lord, the foundations are being destroyed. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to be salt, to be light at school, at work, at home, and abroad. Come on, that's right. Come on. Amen. Amen. Let's come and let's just pray. Jesus, come quickly and get us out of here. Amen. Y'all go ahead. Father, help us this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you need to come, come on, let's pray. Amen. Souls have tested him throughout the course of time. Amen. So many still reach out to yeah. him with broken on, hearts and minds. And every one of them will say, without exception, that they find that Jesus never failed. Yeah, come on now. Even yeah, in the days of old, he brought his people Hi. through. And then he came to show his love, yeah, and he died Let's for me salt. and Let's you. And then he rose world. again to prove yeah, that every story had been true, that Jesus never fails. And I know Jesus never I'm 
God, we got hope. If the foundation be destroyed, what can we do? We can be salt. We can be light. We can reach out and help somebody else. We are in despair. Jesus never fails. So what can I do to prove to you? Tell me how can you deny? No untold facts, no mysteries. It's all so cut and dry. And on the witness stand of your life, I'll be the first to testify that Jesus never If you've been out there in the world all week, you come in here and just get a breath of fresh air. And just get help and hope from on high. And get your tank full and your battery charged. Amen. All right, turn.